In the previous two messages, we focused on the importance of the promised land to the people of Israel. We saw that the land is a special place for Israel. It is an eternal gift to them from God. We also saw that God gave Israel a land covenant as a means to train the people of Israel to walk faithfully with him. In those two messages, our focus was on the special value of the promised land for the people of Israel. In this eighth message of our series, I want to turn our attention to a question that focuses on God himself. Why did God choose Israel to have a special relationship with himself? Let me state that question a bit more succinctly. What is the purpose of Israel in God's eternal plan? Let me offer an answer to that question up front and then take you through a number of scriptures that will flesh out that answer. What is the purpose of Israel in God's eternal plan? Why did God choose Israel to be a special people before him? Why did he give them the promised land? Why did God establish the dynamics of the land covenant? Why did God hold Israel accountable to his laws, the regulations that he identified as statutes, testimonies, and judgments? Why did God promise to bless Israel for obedience and to curse Israel for disobedience? I believe that the answer to all of these questions comes down to the fundamental purpose of Israel in God's eternal plan. God chose Israel in order to glorify himself. Perhaps you are thinking, I already knew that. But before you dismiss this answer as being obvious, or perhaps even trivial, let me ask you a question. What does it mean to glorify God? Pause to think for a moment. We throw that phrase, to glorify God, around rather carelessly. We Christians sing songs in which we express our desire to glorify God. We write doctrinal statements that assert that God is at work in history to glorify himself. I'm not questioning those statements. I agree with them. But I still want to press you to consider this question. What exactly does it mean to glorify God? If I were to ask you to write a dictionary definition of the phrase, to glorify God, what would you write? Let me offer you my own definition of what it means to glorify God. To glorify God means to make his invisible attributes visible. Let me say that again. To glorify God means to make his invisible attributes visible. You can see this meaning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God created mankind to show what he himself is like. God has many personal attributes. For example, God is loving and kind. He is merciful and just. He is intelligent and creative. But God is invisible and he wants to make his invisible attributes visible. God created humans in his image so that we could put his personal attributes on display. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, God's image in them was damaged. It became distorted and tainted. This idea that man was created to glorify God helps us to understand why God hates sin so much. One way to understand the nature of sin is that sin is anything in us that portrays an incorrect image of God. In other words, sin is anything in us that falsely glorifies God. When the second person of the Trinity took on human flesh in the Incarnation, becoming the person whom we know as the Lord Jesus Christ, for the first time in history, the perfect, unsullied, fully accurate revealing of God's invisible attributes by a human being took place. As Jesus walked among men, he showed us what the invisible God is like. This is why when Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, Jesus answered with these words, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Getting back to our discussion of the purpose of Israel in God's eternal plan, we can say, 
that just as God created mankind to glorify himself, he also chose the people Israel in order to glorify himself. Let's examine the evidence of this purpose in the book of Deuteronomy. First, let's consider Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse, uh, chapter 26, verses 16 to 19. This day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore, you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God, and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments, and his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. Also, today the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you, that you should keep all his commandments, and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made, in praise, in name, and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. Several key ideas stand out here. God commands you, Israel, to obey his law. God proclaims you, Israel, to be his special people. God will set you, Israel, high above all other nations. God's purpose is that you, Israel, should be a holy people. In verse 8 of chapter 4, Moses asks this question. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? The answer is obvious, no other nation. When God said to Israel, you are to be a holy nation before me, he was saying, you, Israel, are to be as unlike the other nations as I am unlike the false gods that those nations worship. God's purpose in choosing Israel was to make his holy nature visible to the other nations through the holy behavior of his chosen people, Israel. As long as they live by his laws, other nations will see through their practice of justice, righteousness, mercy, and kindness that Israel's God is a God of justice, righteousness, mercy, and kindness. Israel will glorify God by living lawfully. Their lawful behavior will make visible God's lawful nature. Next, let's consider Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 8 to 9. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandment of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Here God is referring to the blessings of the land covenant that we examined in previous messages. The point that he is making is that when Israel walks in obedience to God, the blessings that he will shower upon them will highlight God's power to bless those who obey him. Israel will glorify God by making his power to bless visible. Their experience of his blessings will make visible God's generosity and make visible his control over the forces of nature and the actions of the surrounding nations. Now let's move on to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 24 to 28. These verses look forward from the days of Moses, anticipating a future day when God will be forced to pour out the worst curses of the land covenant upon the people of Israel. These words look forward to 586 BC, when both Israel and Judah will have been conquered, when the promised land will lie in ruins, and when the people of Israel and Judah will be exiles in foreign lands. Listen now as I read Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 24 to 28. All nations would say, why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heat of this great anger mean? Then people would say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, for they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods that they did not know and that he had not given to them. 
Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring on it every curse that is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, in wrath, and in great indignation, and cast them into another land as it is this day. Here God is clearly referring to the curses of the land covenant. The point that God is making here is that when, in a future day, Israel suffers the penalties of the land covenant, the nations will see evidence that Israel's calamity is no accident. It is judgment from the one true God. Let me state that in another way. In their time of suffering, Israel will glorify God by making his righteous judgment and his power to use the pagan nations as his instruments of judgment visible to all the world. Let's get back to our original question. What is the purpose of Israel in God's eternal plan? Why did God choose Israel for a special relationship with himself? The answer is clear. God chose Israel in order to glorify himself through his interactions with Israel. Let's summarize the different ways that we have seen in which God has glorified himself. In other words, the different ways in which God has made his invisible attributes visible through his interactions with the people of Israel. First, we've seen that God revealed his own holiness by calling Israel to be holy. Israel's holiness took a number of different forms. There was ethical holiness, the kind of holiness that has to do with purity and the avoidance of sin. There was the holiness of separation. Israel was called to be separate from the other nations. She lived apart in her own land. Her people dressed differently. They ate differently. They worshipped differently. And there was the holiness of exclusivity. Israel worshipped only one God, the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Next, we saw that God revealed his generosity and his control over the natural world by his promise to bless Israel for obedience. In the land covenant, God established a unique link between Israel's relationship with God and her material and political circumstances. Finally, we saw that God revealed his righteousness through his promise to impose the covenant penalties upon Israel should she walk contrary to him. We know from Old Testament history that God kept his promise. We also know that God glorified himself further by using pagan nations as his tool of judgment upon his chosen people, Israel. I want to conclude this message with one final observation. The nation Israel received great privileges from God, but with those privileges, they also received great responsibilities. God gave Israel the land. He gave her the land covenant, providing her with the opportunity to be greatly blessed for obedience. God gave Israel prophets. God gave Israel the scriptures. But along with those great privileges, God gave the people of Israel great responsibilities, and the people of Israel did not always live up to those responsibilities. Sometimes things went well for the people of Israel, and sometimes they went horribly wrong. But in every situation, God was working to glorify himself, to reveal to the watching world his invisible attributes. We who know God through the Lord Jesus Christ are also a chosen people, but we are not Israel. Israel's covenants do not apply to us. God never promised to bless us materially for obedience, nor to curse us materially for disobedience. But in some ways, our situation as individual believers parallels that of the nation of Israel. God has given us privileges, and God wants to glorify himself through us. Let us learn from the experience of Israel. Let each of us who knows God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ seek to glorify him by living in such a way that through our behavior, the invisible attributes of God himself may become visible to the people around us.